and welcome to the Cinementalist podcast for Cinementalist.com. My name's Andy, sitting next to me is Floki, our bearded dragon mascot, still sleeping. And sitting opposite me, I'm very much awake, is Liam. How's it going, dude? Yeah, sound as a pound, man, you? Yeah, not bad, thank you. Goody gumdrops. Uh, just before we started recording this evening, uh, someone sent you a message on Twitter, I believe. They did, yeah. Uh, we thought it was uh, worth reading out. Yeah, this is from uh, somebody who claims to be um, from the elite, elite outreach liaison for Illuminatium, <laughs> granted to invite new folks. Everyone is welcome, always for the light. So apparently, and this is the exact wording, so this is no mispronunciation. Verbatim, exactly yeah. How they've written it. So apparently, you were selected among the 10 lucky people giving the opportunity of becoming rich getting $500,000 monthly, a house of your choice around anywhere in the world, and also a car and popular by joining the great Illuminati Brotherhood. And note, there's no such thing as blood sacrifice in this organization. For more details, please reply back with a yes for more details. I mean, we're in. Wow. Wow. I, I, I can't believe it, man. We've been doing this for two years and finally we've been inducted into the inner circle. I mean, it's, I don't know, it says something about me. The, uh, with the immediate moment I read that message, I was just thinking, this guy needs uh, Grammarly or something because that is just <laughs> one fucking hot mess of wording. But <laughs> one, thing we've, one thing we've learned about the Illuminati is they can't spell. Yes. I mean, who knew, right? Well, they need to obscure their identities. I guess, yeah. Even though yeah. they say it'd probably be hard. I'm not going to name him. That would be a bit harsh like, because I don't want to like any inadvertent bombing of the person's profile if he's just <laughs> some like, lone, harmless, eccentric. But, I mean, yeah, this is it's it's different. It's different. It's much, much different from the, from the usual stuff I get in there. It's usually just enthusiastic banter and film suggestions. So I, I know I'm, is this going to be hard to convince you on this, but I really, really want you to reply yes because I'm waiting for the bit where it says... Just send us this one hundred dollar subscription fee, because I yeah. think we should do it. I, I think at this point, you know, why not be part of the Illuminati? Yeah, I'm just. I'm see. Part of me worries that I might be sort of nursing the delusions of some very, very poor, insane man somewhere. And Probably, but it wouldn't be the first time. No, it's true. I'm just trying to get better at that. I think it's better to just like leave the poor soul alone. And I mean, here we are, just um, mocking them on air. Well, we, you know, we haven't named them, so that's key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, God bless you, and, and Just, carry on. Yeah, no, but that—that that is a—that is a, a first. That is a Twitter first. I've seen some head scratching interactions on Twitter. You know, as in, I, I can't really fathom this person's logic in certain contexts, but this is something special. I mean, I don't know if if they're hoping that they can engender some sort of scam operation with this. That is fucking ambitious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And if they actually... You know as well somebody's bought that. Somebody has gone, oh, absolutely. My God, Mildred, I've been invited to the Illuminati. Finally, <laughs> things are looking up. <laughs> Probability suggests so, doesn't it? Yeah, which yeah, is, it really does. Which is kind of, it makes you pause. But yeah. <laughs> I'd like to point out as well that um, poor insane men is a very good tagline for the Cinementalist podcast. It absolutely <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is essentially us. We are Pim. <laughs> Here, as usual, to fill your ears with film news, film reviews, and, uh, well, it's all film reviews this week, actually. I'm yes, reviewing a film as well. You're reviewing a film as well? Yeah, normally we do some TV, but, well, I right. do some TV, but yes, this week I've decided to do it's a, a film. Deluge of film. Absolutely. It's, it's a film special, wouldn't you believe it, from a film podcast. But yes, <laughs> we normally start out with some film news, and I indeed have some in front of me here. Let's kick off with this one. Uh, this is from RottenTomatoes.com. Killian Murphy confirmed as Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. So we talked about this on the podcast recently. That um, yes, we did. Yeah, Chris Nolan was going to make a Oppenheimer and Oppenheimer biopic, and the article reads: Throughout Hollywood's long history of making movies about real life figures, it's a lingering complaint that actors frequently do not look like the real life figures they are portraying. For Oppenheimer, about the life of the father of the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer, director Christopher Nolan appears to be sidestepping such criticisms by casting frequent collaborator Killian Murphy, who played his scarecrow in Batman Begins as the titular scientist, and the resemblance is sort of uncanny. I would agree on that one, actually, looking at photos of uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Good old J. Rob. What, him and Killian Murphy? Yeah, they do actually. Look, I mean, if he shaved his head. 
Uh, I, th- I think it's actually quite a good match. And oh, Killian okay. Murphy is a fantastic actor. He certainly is. I like him a lot. So, yeah. yeah, we brought it up on the podcast before with Killian Murphy as rumoured. And we both said that would be a great casting choice. And it appears Chris Nolan's going forward with it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, actually. I think it will really suit um, Chris Nolan's kind of mind-bending, uh, detail-focused, slightly trippy bent. Also, um, uh, Nolan first in that it's going to be a, bi- a biopic. Yeah, I believe so. I don't think he's done. I don't think he's one, done he? a biopic before. Yeah, there's some there's some glaring omission that I should know about. Someone will write in, but I'm almost certain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, good casting there, and uh, very much looking forward to seeing that when it eventually comes out. Some people, some people might be pretending and say like, "Well, you know, he did Dunkirk, and those, you know, several military personnel were modelled on real people." Uh, yeah, so. based on a real life tale, I suppose it's not quite <clears> a biopic. Based on true events. And we could say, fuck you, you're reaching, go away. <laughs> to these completely hypothetical people who probably n- would never exist. That is very, very true. <laughs> Our next article this week, this is from the Guardian.com. Quentin Tarantino says he wants to make a comedy. Well, he's made plenty of those. Well, arguably, yeah, there's always an element of comedy in his film, isn't there? You could argue that just about all of his films have uh, like a hybrid comedy What's, aspect. What, what is one Tarantino film that actually plays it straight? That's true. But then to be a comedy, I think you have to be like outright going for gags, where he sort of blends it, doesn't he? There's definitely humor in there, but I wouldn't say he's made an outright comedy yet. Um, he was speaking at the Rome Film Festival, where he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award. And in remarks reported by Variety, the director discussed future projects, which include a book of film criticism. Shit, I'm writing one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Got a feeling his might be better. Damn. <clears throat> and a now, t- now, don't fucking damn yourself, lad. <laughs> and a TV series. And added, first, I want to make a comedy. He then went on to describe a scenario he was working on, but not like my next movie, something else that I'm thinking about doing. Tarantino said it involved a spaghetti western. It's going to be really fun because I want to shoot it in the spaghetti western style where everyone's speaking a different language. The Mexican bandido is an Italian, the hero is an American, the bad sheriff is a German, the Mexican saloon girl is Israeli, and everybody is speaking a different language. And the actors just know, okay, when he's finished talking, then I can talk. Tarantino also explained that it was only by taking acting classes that he realized that instead he wanted to direct. He said, not only did I love movies more than the other kids in the class, but I cared about them whereas I think they only cared about themselves. And the reason why is that I love movies too much to be an actor. So throwing some shade there at the end as well. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> but this seems to be, Tarantino has very, very recently, we reported on it actually, within the last six months, reaffirmed that he's only got one movie left in his uh, potential oeuvre. And... Well, yeah, I mean, that's um, straight from the horse's mouth, isn't it? Didn't he say that he would, like he is retiring by the time he's 60? Yeah. And And that's only two years away. Ten feature films in total. And he keeps banging on as well. He keeps cropping up talking about Kill Bill 3. So I've got a funny feeling, as we all suspected, that Tarantino is not going to hold to his ten film. I mean, why should he? It's an arbitrary rule. But why do you need a a Kill Bill 3? That that narrative got wrapped up. Yeah, pretty conclusively, right? Yeah, I don't... What more would you need to do in the Kill Bill-verse... Um, uh, whatever. Yeah, he's got plans, apparently. And I think he's one of those people as well that, although he's put this arbitrary rule set on himself of 10 films and I'm out, uh, he's got so many ideas, I just can't see it happening. So he's already talking about not only Kill Bill 3, but a spaghetti Western comedy where every character is speaking a different language, which is just... I mean, let's talk about the concept of that for a second. I mean, that is fucking bizarre. Well, I mean, without mincing words, as soon as you um, explain that, I thought, that sounds like a fucking nightmare. Does a bit. Just just, just right off the bat, just conceptually, I know that I am not a director, so if he goes ahead with that, he's probably going to execute it in a way that I couldn't have fathomed. And maybe you'll end up going like, oh, well, okay, so he's doing it like that. That's pretty clever. He also- but just immediately, I'm thinking, nah, that sounds horrific. <laughs> well, the funny thing about this, I think, is that he doesn't make clear whether the characters can understand each other in different languages. He said the whole thing about the actors going like, okay, so the actor's not going to know what the actor opposite them is saying, but they're going to just know that when he's finished his lines, I can start speaking, which sounds like a nightmare for the actors in terms of sequencing and, it, and the editing as well, for that matter, because the timing is going to be all over the place. Because that's the hard thing when you're listening to someone speaking a language you don't speak. <clears throat> it all sounds like babble because you can't tell where the gaps are. So that just sounds ridiculous. I can just—I'm—I'm I'm just imagining this really clinic 
this really clinical boardroom meeting full of weird tips going like, we have devised a new comedy. Everybody in the wild vest speaks every single language in the world. <laughs> it's, it's just like, oh, I just can't wrap my head around it. No, me neither, to be honest. But I do want to see it. So and I want to see it a lot more than Kill Bill 3, if I'm honest, as well. Because as you said... I yeah, I'd that, agree with you on that one. That narrative tied up pretty conclusively. So at least he's got good ideas, at the very least. Well, yeah, because... The, that uh, you know the the finale of the of um the Kill Bill f- um franchise, the finale of the way that arc wraps to continue that would make that ending it would it would just lessen its the poetic nature of it. It would lessen the clout of it. And isn't that the sort of thing that he's always banging on about? Isn't that the whole reasoning behind his ten film rule is that he doesn't want his legacy to be ruined by lesser works? Yeah, it sounds like going back to a narrative that you already concluded is by its very nature going to end up being very likely a lesser work. It's often yeah. not a good idea to go back to your previous films and try and add bits to them. It's the it's the Lucas effect, isn't it? Yeah. You go back and fuck with it, you ruin the original. Take Kill Bill specifically, just for an example. Um, I don't dislike the films. I think they're quite fun. I'm not as uh, like adulating of them as some of Tarantino's fanboys who claim that they're two of like, the best films ever. I, I just personally would wildly disagree with that. How, that being said, watching the two movies, they're well made. They are enjoyable, and the way that they the way that they wrap up is satisfying. Even someone like me who's not crazy about them, it's satisfying. Yeah, they're okay. So yeah, yeah. The, the first more yeah. than the second, I would argue, but yeah. I still enjoy the second. Again, I've spoken about it before, but um, I find with Tarantino films, they often improve on the second or third watch. I didn't think much of Kill Bill Volume 2 on the first watch, whereas I really quite liked Kill Bill Volume 1. And then I've seen it a couple of times since, and each time I've got something a bit more from it. Yeah. It's, it's a more subtle film than it initially That's appears. That's true. I, just, I don't know what it is, man. I just, it's like I, lo- I love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And I've seen people going like, oh, I want to see like, you know, we want to see a lot more of uh, Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth. And I'm thinking like, well... I don't really, because the way that the film closes, actually, you know, because it's a mad cocktail of Tarantino's quintessential extreme violence. But there's, you know, and there is some slapstick humour in there and some bizarro humour in there. But there's also a cool bit of poignancy in that ending, the way he retcons something evil happening. And I think just uh, maybe, okay, if you wanted like some limited series where which focused on them, maybe that could work. But I just actually think even though I adore that film, no, just leave it alone, leave it as it is. It's yeah. self-contained. It's absolutely fine as it is. Don't fucking poke it with a stick and try and try and extrapolate it into all this nonsense. Absolutely. And for someone with so many good, bad, and ugly ideas, I just want to see more of those brought to the screen. Especially if we're only going to get you know, one, or if he breaks his rule, maybe two or three films left. I'd like to see more of those original ideas come to screen. Original yeah. ideas are almost always better than sequels, with some notable exceptions. I would say. But there you absolutely. Go. Ah, uh, article from the AV Club here. The Last Duel is officially Ridley Scott's worst performing box office premiere. Really? Yeah. The wow. medieval set drama pulled in a measly $4.8 million over its opening weekend, which sounds like a lot of money to you and me, but when you're looking at um, film budget and blockbuster stuff, it's uh, pretty paltry. Uh, the article reads, After raking in a meager $4.8 million during its box office debut, Ridley Scott's epic The Last Duel enters the flop zone. The film has earned the title of Scott's worst performing premiere ever, as per The Hollywood Reporter. Whether the blame is on poor marketing, an older target audience, or having to compete with Halloween kills, that's all up for debate. But The Last Duel is a significant low for the prolific director behind successes such as Alien, Blade Runner, and Gladiator. The 14th century French set film boasted heavy hitters Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Ben Affleck, and Jodie Comer, and so far has received glimmering reviews from critics. However, it simply has not performed when it comes to theatre ticket sales, only a fraction of its, and wait for it, $100 million budget. $100 million? Yeah. Wow. You say it's got consistently good critical feedback, though. According to this article, uh, again, we've been trying to avoid reviews left, right, and centre until we can see it for ourselves. However... I can't help escaping some stuff in my newsfeed about Matt Damon not being very good in it. And I have to say the trailer's being played a lot on UK TV. I've seen the trailer a few times now and Matt Damon doesn't look very good in it. Um, whether that's a potential problem, I don't know. Or whether that star power is simply worn off for Matt Damon. I don't know. Or even Ridley Scott. Something's going on here anyway. Or what I'm really hoping is it's not people have lost interest in uh, medieval historical pieces because I really like those. <laughs> I'd like to see more directors make them. I think that um, 
the competition that is facing from Halloween Kills would be making not a small contribution to its box office obscurity, personally. Yeah, and we're sitting... So what I'm seeing, hearing people fucking talk about over the past few days is Halloween Kills, Halloween Kills, Halloween Kills. Yeah. And it's just driving me insane, personally. Well, we're also sitting right in the middle of uh, James Bond No Time to Die territory as well, and a couple of other big releases, one of which I believe uh, you're covering in a minute. Yeah. This, so it's it, maybe... Um, one that's more important than all the others, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> But yeah, it may just be simply a bad timing on the part of the, uh, it, you know, could have done better on a lull rather than a, um, quite a peak in uh, big budget blockbuster releases. Yeah. That's a hard sentence. So. <laughs> nice bit of tongue twisting. <laughs> uh, my last article here. Uh, this is just mad. This is also from the AV Club. Mel Gibson. I mean, any, <laughs> any article that starts out Mel yeah. Gibson is just, you know, straight away your ears prick up, don't they? Mel Gibson set to star in John Wick TV spin-off, breaking the series' perfect streak of coolness. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, directly from the article here. The John Wick series rules. I actually disagree. I think the first one's pretty good and the others are, yeah, declining. It does not fucking rule. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. The fight scenes are fun. The increasingly bonkers mythology is cool. And Keanu Reeves' John Wick serves as a reminder to protect the things in your life that help you feel like a fully realized person while rejecting the pressures from those in power to reduce yourself to a machine that only exists to do one useful job. I think they're stretching a little bit in the writing. <laughs> Three movies in, it seemed like it would just be a matter of time before John Wick would screw that all up somehow, with the safest bet being that the series would eventually go way too far up its own ass, it did in the second, with the mythology stuff. That might still happen, but no, the John Wick series just managed to screw it up with a casting decision. According to Deadline, Mel Gibson is going to star in Star's spin-off series, The Continental, as a new character named Cormac. I mean, I disagree with the premise from the very start that the John Wick series rules. I really do. I know it's supposed to be over the top. I know it's supposed to be ridiculous, but there's a point where it jumps the shark. There's a point where it becomes, what am I watching here? I'm literally just watching fight sequences and the fight sequences all start to look the same. They barely well. have stories. Yeah. Even, I mean, look at, like, you know, Bruce Lee's highest billing films. They're all martial arts extravaganzas, but you can individuate them and you can pinpoint coherent stories happening throughout them, however boilerplate they might be. John Wick is just, okay, we've got this kind of very, very vaguely outlined excuse for John Wick to kill loads of people again. That's, yeah, that's it. And it, and, and it the, does get tedious. And the, the joke was in the first one that someone killed his dog and beat him up. We, you know, we did a horrible event and everything. But as we discussed, I think we did it on the premium podcast recently that John Wick is essentially a serial killer. I mean, yeah. I, know, I know they killed your dog, man, but I mean, some of those mobsters have families. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and they're not, they're not but, psychopathic sadists. Some of them are just fucking just flunkies. It, and... it was sort of a joke plot, though, wasn't it? It was a joke setup, essentially saying, look, we need an excuse for uh, Keanu Reeves to go mad with some guns. Here's your excuse. Now enjoy the guns. And I was with that. Doing three films out of it was stretching that joke too thin for me. Just a little bit, yeah. And adding a TV series on top, I think, stretches it even thinner. But there you go. I'll watch it. I'll review it. I'll try and go in as unbiased. Just play it. I mean, if you like... Mel Gibson will be in it. I mean, that, that's, that'll be interesting. And why can't people just... I mean, if they can't get enough of this kind of shit, just play the Hitman games. Yeah, that's Same kind of deal, except there's a bit more imagination oh, put in the narrative. Or like. watch all those other films since that have tried to be John Wick. I do get a bit annoyed with that. How many releases have we covered where we go? It's essentially John Wick, but in Louisiana. All it's the movies, John Wick, but in or all the movies before John Wick that John Wick would not exist without. Yeah, you know, it's, it's people acting like John Wick has broken this, broken some ground. No, no, it hasn't. It's, it just hasn't. Oh, just, uh, let's just wait and see. Eh, as let's always. wait and see. Anyways, anyways, this is the part of the podcast where Liam reviews a couple of films, and I'm particularly excited about one of them this week. But Liam, take it away, whatever order you would like. Thank you very much, sir. Well, after about, I'd say, what is it, a good two years now of waiting and wondering, I finally sat down and watched Denival News June. I am excited. Denival News June. Now, um, I'm not not really sure how much of our listeners are going to be au fait with the story here, but Frank Herbert's Dune, 1965 novel Dune. I am not a massive sci-fi slash fantasy person. I'm really not. But I, fuck, I love that book. I think it's absolute triumph. I think it's really richly detailed and fascinating, and I just love the world building that Herbert did. Um, I just think so many of the characters, they're so finely drawn. 
there's such I know people have talked about the density of it, but I just think it's just a thing of beauty, the imagery it conjures, the complexity, the intrigue, everything about it. It's just it's just a really fabulous piece of work. So um sort of to outline the synopsis in conjunction with this direct adaptation, because Dune has been adapted twice, once in 1984 by David Lynch, and in 2000 they did a mini-series, Frank Herbert's Dune, and they also did another one called Frank Herbert's Children of Dune, which is because there was a series of Dune novels, but I admittedly have only read the first one. And uh, so there we have a universe where um, a group of noble families noble houses, they control planetary fiefs, essentially, you know, as in F-I-E-F-S, not like thief, as in thief, in a yes, Cockney accent. in a London yes. accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's my they control a load of thieves. <laughs> yeah, they control a load of planetary thieves. So you have um, House Atreides, who uh, reside on the planet Caladan, and um, they manage a world. They have a very um, fair... And, and, you know, decent meritocratic society. Uh, the people there are very spiritually nourished and they just lead good lives. And it's just a very beautiful environment. The house uh, takes good care of the inhabitants. They allow industry to flourish, um, but they clamp down on things like exploitation and in all other kinds of... Um, they don't ha really have any social ills on Caladan, thanks to House of Treaties. House of Treaties is presided over by Duke Leto, first, who in uh, the film is played by Oscar Isaac and uh, Duke Leto's wife, Lady Jessica, played by Rebecca Ferguson, and their son, Paul Atreides, who is very important to the dual na dual narrative, here played by Timothy Chalamet. Opposing the Atreides, or, you know, an uneasy truce, shall we say, is House Harkonnen, or Harkonnen, depending on what pronunciation you like, who reside on the planet of Gidi Prime. Now, the Harkonnens are the polar opposite of House Atreides. They are a very, very cruel house. They have no problems, no qualms whatsoever with exploitation of labour, slavery, um, just engaging in the most horrendous bilious cruel shit uh, to earn a quick buck um, and they are ruled over by Baron Vladimir Harkonnen who is a, a man of incredible intellect and cunning which is matched only by how much of a fucking warped sadist he is very very dangerous individual and House of Treaties and House Harkonnen are both vying for control of the planet Arrakis um, which is otherwise known by the name, the titular name, Dune. Now, Arrakis is a desert planet, and um, it's also the only place where you can get the universe's most valuable commodity, which is melange, which is most commonly referred to as the spice. Now, this is a drug that not only um, provides uh, users with really, really insane mental acuity and uh, longer lifespan, but it's also essential for space navigation by giving multidimensional awareness and stuff like that. And space navigation is essential to universal everyday life and commerce. So Melange is basically is the most valuable, most important thing in the universe. And Arrakis is the only place you can harvest it, really, and mine for it. And so um, essentially the House of Treaties are given stewardship of the planet Arrakis. So they have to move from Caladan to Arrakis. And obviously House Harkonnen, who um, spent the previous 80 years making very, very, very much money from spice production have been ousted. And so the Baron is very, very unhappy and starts to connive to thwart the Atreides reallocation to Arrakis and essentially topple out Atreides and take back control of spice marketing and production. And whilst the Harkonnens are engaged in their horrible little machinations, Paul Atreides, here played by Timothy Chalamet, realises that he is not merely the heir to some noble house. He actually has a much larger purpose that is uh, prophesied by the, the Bene Gesserit, which is a sect that his mother is a practitioner of. And uh, it involves Paul becoming involved with uh, the indigenous Arrakis inhabitants, the Fremen, who are a desert people. And um, so essentially, it's just one bit. It's, it's like uh, proto Game of Thrones, essentially. 
Yeah, yeah, right. quite a lot of similarities. You know, lot of, yeah. lot of noble houses, a lot of political intrigue, people vying, you know, in this case, it's not the Iron Throne. In this case, it's Arrakis, or more specifically, it's a, you know, it's a drug on a specific planet and the absolute necessity of having control of that if you want domination and just the intersecting paths of one force which is essentially benevolent or at least more benevolent than others and one force that is extraordinarily evil. And the f- it's the fate of the universe hanging in the balance tale. That's pretty much the plot of Dune, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I remember the book, yeah. Now, as I said at the start, I love this story. I adore this story. It is so refreshing to finally get an adaptation that does this fucking novel justice. The David Lynch one from 1984 is good for a laugh, but I am in full agreement with Peter Bradshaw. It's like Flash Gordon without the laughs. Yeah, it was pretty... You, know, you can laugh. It was pretty hokey. You know, I, I, I watched the 84 one for a giggle, but you've got like people with heart plugs. You've got Baron Harkonnen, who in the novel is depicted as this... In the literary Baron Harkonnen is this very two-faced, cold schema who is able to keep a lid on his emotions and is very, 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 very adept at manipulating people and destroying people. In the Lynch adaptation, he's this cackling maniac who has to constantly be restrained and talked down by his underlings. And it's like that was moderately improved in the miniseries where he's played by Ian McNeese. But here, Baron Harkonnen is portrayed by Stellan Skarsgård and he is fucking creepy. So far, now, we've mentioned before about the sort of minor controversy about this or possibly major controversy in that this is Dune part one. Um, Villeneuve has every intention to make the second part. He desperately wants to, but obviously Warner Bros. said to him that they'll green light part two, providing that Dune part one performs well at the box office. Yeah, he's also very unhappy Which with the whole- Which is fucking uh, ridiculous to me. Right? Yeah, he was really unhappy with, um, there's been a lot of controversy about the HBO Max and the, putting Warner Brothers releases there as a simultaneous release kind of thing as well. Yeah, I just happy with that. I, I, I'm not I'm I'm not happy with the way that they've treated Villeneuve on this because let me tell you, this is very much is as it's, the title comes up, June Part One. This is this film covers the first half of the book, so he is sticking to his words to adapt it as faithfully but as realistically as possible. And this one, without giving anything away, has had some complaints about an abrupt ending. But it's completely appropriate given what Villeneuve is doing to it because it's the end of one chapter and the way that he has executed the adaptation of the first half of the novel, it's just one, it's brilliant to look at for for a start. The cinematography by Greg Fraser, it's just really, really illustrious, visually wowing. I've heard some people talk about how the Lynch one is um, a visual feast, but I think this movie is just... Mag- like just by many orders of magnitude, more the cornea teaser. It's more than one. Wow, fucking hell! Look at the SFX on that. Look at the SFX bollocks on that. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, really gorgeous to look at. Hans Zimmer's score. Hans Zimmer actually turned down um, another opportunity to work with Nolan because he he really, really wanted to take Vill- up Villeneuve's invitation to work on Dune, and he did it. And he has concocted this brilliant soundscape. Timothy Chalamet is... I, I've never thought much of Timothy Chalamet, probably because I haven't been exposed to a lot of his work. But he's very, very good as the young Paul Atreides. Also, all of the performances, they're good. They're really... It's an, it's an emotionally charged film. You believe these people. You believe, you know, Oscar Isaac as Leto and Chalamet as Paul, like Rebecca Ferguson as Jessica... And all the, you know, all the um, the House of Treaties, um, you know, henchmen and swordmasters, characters like Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck, you know, respectively played by Jason Momoa and Josh Brolin, really, really good. Th- you, this time you don't laugh at the Harkonnen. The Lynch Harkonnens were fucking buffoons. Here they're actually, they're menacing and creepy. Dave Batista as Glossu Raban, like Stellan Skarsgård as the Baron, the Mentat, Peter DeFries. Th- this time around they're all... They're all chilling. They're all like fucking actually scary. And it makes the stakes feel higher. And yeah, I just think um, if you are a fan of epic 
battles between the forces of good and evil with really, really rich, well thought out, complex, really interesting detail that, you know, with a story that moves at an excellent pace. If you want to see a book that constitutes one of the finest examples of it, actually have the ad, the kind of adaptation it was supposed to have, then you need to see the most recent adapt this most recent adaptation of Dune. Because I w- I was approaching this with nerves because I love the story so much. And I yeah, I'm very happy to report that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed every single second of it. It was really good. Villeneuve put his money where his mouth is. He said he wanted to do the book justice and he's done the book justice. The only really frustrating thing is it's going to be a ways off until we get part two. And that is out of, that's out of Villeneuve's hands. He wants to go ASAP, but he's essentially had by the balls by higher ups, mm. isn't he? And it's, yeah, it's just very frustrating because he's taken all these ingredients, he's mixed them all up. And the result is, is just excellent. It's excellent. I, I, can, I cannot think of one thing about this adaptation that I do not like. I, re- I really can't. I, I, I loved it. And I would love, I'd watch it again anytime soon. I'm just pissed. I'm going to have to wait a while for the, for the second part. Oh, I'm very glad to hear it. Yeah, no, it's good, good man. Stuff. It's, yeah, absolutely. No, if it's, you know, it's finally, sometimes things come home nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and up next, so we've had the grand epic film. Now we're tackling a nice bit of popcorn. This is, uh, this is Cop Shop which is a new release by Joe Carnahan, focal player. This is someone I believe you quite like, actually, is uh, Frank Grillo. Oh, I do like Frank Grillo, yeah. yeah I think this Underrated, is, I think I think this is. is from the same team as Boss Level. I, like, yeah. I, I thought, I reviewed that on the premium, and I thought it was uh, much, much better than everyone else gave it credit for. You liked really, that a lot, didn't I you? I really yeah. enjoyed it, yeah. I thought, yeah. It, I thought it was splashy and fun and interesting. I lamentably still haven't seen it because I'm essentially useless but uh, yeah I really want to get round to Boston because it does sound thoroughly like it got completely buried in the whole um, COVID yeah mess essentially yeah and it ended up being a really really good film more people should watch it as did many good things tragically well Frank Grillo and believe it or not this is actually the first time I've seen Frank Grillo in anything Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I poor, again just it's just like poor form abounds for me. <laughs> so what am I doing? Frank Grillo, uh, Frank Grillo stars with a guy named Teddy Moretto. Now, it's set in Nevada, and Teddy is a con man, and as the film opens, he's bulleting down a dusky Nevada highway in a bullet-strewn Crown Vic police car and uh, desperately trying to get away from someone. And um, after a sort of little bit of hullabaloo and a, a police chase, Teddy ends up approaching a young rookie police officer who is trying to quell this uh, noisy wedding reception outside of a venue. He walks up to um, this young rookie cop, Valerie Young, played by Alexis Lauder, and uh, he just sparks her. He punches her in the face to the ground and uh, you know, in quite an abrupt way, thinking, what the fuck is up with this guy? And then he stands there and starts shouting, will somebody please arrest me? Valerie gets up. There's a load of other cops uh, training their guns on Teddy. Valerie tases him. Make sure it hurts as retaliation and bundles Teddy into the back of a cruiser and casts him off to the police station. Meanwhile, this whole debacle is being watched by a rather sinister looking gentleman in a blacked out car who appears to be on Teddy's tail. And so Teddy's got it off. He's put in lock up. Um, he's booked in. I think like some of the cops there, they are familiar with him. Becomes apparent that he is very much, he is a con artist and never do well. Uh, he's been arrested um, more times than most of the cops have made busts, is like one of the lines used in reference to him in the film. And he's just there sweating it out in a cell. Then a severely pissed hobo-looking guy is being dragged into the station, barely able to stand up by two officers. Uh, he's been arrested for a DUI. Um, they drag him in there. They insult him about the fact that he stinks of piss. They lead him into the cells, facing opposite Teddy's cells, put him inside. The guy actually falls over and smacks his head on the floor because he is so motherfucking drunk. And Teddy kind of looks at this with vague amusement. And then the evening just carries on. But eventually, this drunk guy comes to his feet. And as Teddy's pacing up and down his cell, this drunk dude begins doing the same thing. 
And Teddy kind of looks over at him and is like, what is, what is this guy's problem? And the drunk looks up and reveals that he's not drunk at all. The drunk is actually Bob Vidic, played by Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler. And Bob Vidic is an extremely dangerous organized crime hitman. And he allows his face to be better illuminated by poking it through the cell bars and looking directly at Teddy across the way and says, I did what I did to get in here because I'm here for you, Teddy. And uh, Teddy knows exactly who this guy is. And understandably, he starts to panic a little bit. <laughs> So, meanwhile, the cops are basically trying to figure out who the fuck both of these guys are. The guy who, bought the Bob Vidic character who hitherto they're just treating as a John Doe. And why the hell Teddy got himself arrested. What he is running from. And this is all set against the backdrop on the news of the recent murder of the Nevada State Senator. Which just seems like a little bit of an incidental footnote, but it becomes rather instrumental to the plot as it continues. And lo and behold, after Bob makes his identity known to Teddy, he then goes on to violently make his identity known to the other denizens in the police station. But it doesn't strictly go as Bob plans. So then even bigger bads who are aware of the free fire contract on Teddy's head, they are aware of his incarceration, his temporary incarceration at least. And so they descend upon the police station as well. Now, this is film is probably sounding to a lot of people like an assault on precinct 13 ripoff, but it's not for a start. I've run into that complaint a couple of times since I've watched it and I find it quite irritating because I think it's a very superficial and lazy one. Yes, the setting is a police station. Yes, you know, there are adversarial agents trying to get into the police station to target somebody for one reason or another. But just to go, oh, it's like Salt and Precinct 13, I do think that's a very lazy and irritating comparison, mainly because the villains in Salt and Precinct 13 are a very shadowy you know, virtually supernatural, not literally supernatural, virtually supernatural, uh, faceless evil, which is not the case whatsoever in Cop Shop. But it is very much, it's a 70s, 80s action sort of throwback. It's very darkly funny and it's very, very violent. And um, do you know what? I was actually not expecting much at all from this film. I just, I stuck it on because it's a new release and because it's got some faces in it. And I'm actually quite happy to say that I had a real good time with it. I thought it was. I thought it was a lot of fun. I, I really liked Frank Grillo's lead performance as Teddy Moretto. He's got this. I remember you were sort of giving him really good appraisal when you were reviewing Boss Level, and at that point, I didn't really know who the guy was. But he's got this kind of, uh, especially. I mean, in this at least, he's got this sort of quiet, intense, streetwise kind of mystery about him. He really, really plays this uh, this duplicitous con artist, opportunist very well. And there's this nice back and forth where, um, as Bob Vidic, Gerard Butler is in the cell, the two of them eventually, uh, it beca there's a sort of mental, emotional menage a trois between the two of them and Valerie Young, the rookie cop. Not a fucking romantic one or a physical one, but the three of them incidentally get to know each other better or they, have, they become more intimate to each other in verbal exchange. And Bob Vidic keeps saying to... Valerie, like, whatever he's telling you, don't fucking trust him. He's telling you to let him out of his cell because he can help with, like, these other nutters who are here trying to fuck him up as well. Don't listen to him. He's out for himself. You know, he'll just, he'll, you know, if he says he's going to come back and help you, he'll leave you behind. This guy's a fucking snake. Leave him alone. So, you know, and so Valerie's thinking, this guy is a hit man. And he's telling me that I have more to fear from this guy over here who just seems like a bit of an opportunistic con artist prick, but not a homicidal nutter. And yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't break any new ground, but the script is really punchy. I really, really like the performances. I, I love Gerard Butler as Bob Vidic. Really, really good, grizzled, darkly amusing villain. Toby Huss as uh, Anthony Lamb, who's another one of the contract killer nuts. He's really good. It's just really fun. It's really fun, and it actually subverts a lot of audience expectations. Um, it ends on a really good note. I just think it's it's solid bubblegum. 
It's really solid. Nothing bubblegum. wrong with that. No, no, no. And and like it, the it's also bookended by very seventy style titles and kind of like Lalo Schifrin esque score. So it it is. It's just a love letter to seventies and eighties action, and it's very enjoyable. And it does what it says in the tin. And yeah, I think you'll have a great night with it. Hey, so yeah, excellent. I do think Frank Grillo is very, very underrated as an actor. It, again, yeah, he's first thing I've seen him in, and I, I liked his work. And he he makes a good sort of action thriller star. Yeah, he absolutely. does. He's very, very, he's very well cut out for it. I think so. Yeah, I'll be I'll be looking at more from him. Okay, then. Well, uh, this is my film of the week rather than TV of the week. Decided to give myself a little bit of a break and catch up with some stuff. And decided to review a big release instead. And I decided to watch The Suicide Squad. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, this um, one there is sort of pretending the other one didn't really exist. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the studio has been reluctant to call it a reboot, although it very much essentially is. And I will get onto that in a bit. But yes, this is James Gunn's take on the Suicide Squad concept. So supervillains go out on missions and as a result, chaos ensues and doing a more kind of um, splashy, hyper-violent kind of thing. And it is a superhero movie, which traditionally we are quite down on on the podcast because a lot of them are, let's face it, trash. Yes, um, just a, few a, bit. Pe- a few people just turned off right there, but there you go. I mean, there are some good ones. There's, there's, you know, and James Gunn has done some good ones as well. Let's face it with the Guardians of the Galaxy stuff. But yes, we are a little bit down on superhero stuff. We have been criticized for it and we don't care. Um, <laughs> let me start out with the plot set up to this then. So we start off with a mysterious long haired man, man with long gray hair sitting in a prison yard, essentially a concrete box. And he's looking down at his shoes and he is bouncing a bouncy ball around the four square walls of his prison yard. And a little bird lands in the corner of the yard to eat some detrius on the floor. And you've got this cute little bird bouncing around in the corner. He throws the bouncy ball and he kills it immediately in graphic fashion. So he's a nice fella. Lovely man. Yeah. Yep. Um, he looks up as someone enters the yard to call him elsewhere. And he's revealed to be Michael Rooker uh, oh. playing for the purposes of this film, a supervillain called Savant. And he is dragged out of the yard and brought in to meet Amanda Waller, played by Viola Davis. Now, she's actually one of the few actors that was in the first Suicide Squad that we're not supposed to talk about that has made the transition over to this film. Now, those that have seen Suicide Squad remember that Amanda Waller is the director of Argus. And they run what's called the Task Force X program which is essentially taking supervillains, um, offering them a chance to reduce their sentence now they've been incarcerated by sending them off on suicidal missions in the hope that they can do some good in the world. At Argos. Yeah. At Argos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't get the joke, in the UK is a, a department store. <laughs> but, but it would yes. have made the film maybe more interesting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Rather than sending him to work at Argos and shuffle around furniture, <laughs> he is instead uh, being sent off to perform a suicidal mission. And so he's put on a helicopter with the rest of his team we have uh, Joel Kinnaman playing Colonel Rick Flagg. Uh, Pete Davidson is playing Blackguard, who's sort of a mercenary soldier kind of type. Uh, Jai Courtney is playing Captain Boomerang. He uh, also appeared in the original Suicide Squad film. Uh, Nathan Fillon is playing uh, Corey Pitzner or TDK, the detachable kid. We have Flula Borg as Javelin. Sean Gunn, who's voicing Weasel who is a CGI weasel that has no dialogue whatsoever. <laughs> and again, from the first film, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. Mm-hmm. And they are sent off on their mysterious mission. So, middle of the night, helicopter arrives outside a very a tropical South American kind of looking island. And they're all kicked out of the chopper into the ocean. Now, at this point, everyone has realized that nobody checked whether a weasel could swim, which he can't. So he drowns immediately, the CGI weasel character. He's dragged onto shore by the savant. He tries to perform mouth to mouth. The weasel is immediately dead. They make their way onto the beach of this island and they're immediately surrounded by a bunch of mercenary looking soldiers approaching them from the jungle. It's at this point that Blackguard breaks from rank, walks forward and starts to speak to the soldiers. Turns out he's sold them all out. Okay. So he's walking towards them going, guys, 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 you didn't need this many of us. I told you already, everything would be fine. Look, all you got to do is take me in. And everything is immediately interrupted by gunfire. Blackguard's face is shot off. 
Captain Boomerang starts throwing his boomerangs, but is murdered immediately. Weasel's still dead on the beach. And Colonel Rick Flagg takes up some cover position with Harley Quinn behind some rocks, and he's screaming into his radio to the Argus team back at base, going, what the hell's going on here? Uh, TDK, the detachable kid, Nathan Fillon, he does his best. His arms come off and fly off into the distance. Turns out all he can really do is slap them ineffectively because <laughs> it's a useless superpower. Why would you bring a guy <laughs> that could just detach his arms off? And Javelin is shot and killed as well. Now, this sounds like spoilers, by the way. I'm, I'm literally five minutes into the film at this point. Okay, This so. all takes place in five minutes. This is the intro to the <laughs> film. Yeah, it, it, all of a sudden, it's an absolute bloodbath. And the only survivors of this bloodbath are Harley Quinn and Rick Flagg. Rick Flagg runs away into the jungle to try and get some cover. And Harley Quinn finds herself trapped in a crater with the dying Javelin, who hands her his Javelin and says, keep hold of this. You need to keep it for, and dies immediately. So she's very, very annoyed that he never finished his sentence. Why the hell does she need this javelin? We cut back to Amanda Waller back at her HQ with the, the rest of the Argos team looking in horror at what's happened on their monitors. She sighs and says, okay, what about the B team? What about team number two? We get a cut back to the island and emerging out of the water are the actual stars of this film where we get the credits, Suicide Squad. So it's a fake out intro, essentially. Mm. Don't feel too bad about spoiling it because again, at this point, we are literally 10 minutes into the film. The B team, the actual Suicide Squad, consists of Idris Elba, who's playing Bloodsport, uh, John Cena, who's playing Peacemaker. John Cena. Daniela Melcher as Ratcatcher 2. Uh, King Shark, who's voiced by Sylvester Stallone. He looks like a, sort of a cross between a Great White and the Hulk. Yeah. And Polka Dot Man, <laughs> played by David Dasmalchian. And we get a little sequence where Idris Elba is also in prison, uh, locked up as blood sport. He's scraping chewing gum off the floors, and he too is recruited by Amanda Waller to become part of the Suicide Squad. And he's put together with his motley crew of also rans in a meeting room where Amanda very, very nicely explains the plot for us, which is essentially, they're all being sent to the South American island nation of Corto Maltese, which has a tyrannical uh, anti-American government. And they've been tasked with destroying a Nazi-era laboratory, Jotunheim, which, according to Amanda, holds a secretive experiment known as Project Starfish. So their job is to be dropped in and destroy whatever this mysterious project is. The project is helmed by our supervillain of the piece, The Thinker, played by Peter Capaldi. Oh, wow, okay. So a lot of known faces popping up in this. So we now have the B team on the beach, making their way through the jungle, trying to succeed where the A team has failed. Uh, Harley Quinn and Ric Flair are now off in the jungle, and they will come back, of course, later. All okay with the setup on that one? Yeah, yeah, pretty so, much. It is quite straightforward, actually. I, I like that, actually. After all the difficult ones I've had to do recently, this has got a, quite a nice, simple setup, as long as you get past the fake-out intro. Ah, so, Suicide Squad, the original, was an unbelievable hot mess of a film. I actually recommend people to watch Suicide Squad because it's messed up in a way that I don't think I've ever seen any other film be messed up as if that makes sense. (laughs) It's kind of like they took all the digital film, they printed it on film stock, they cut it all up with razor blades, they threw it in the air, and where it landed is where it ended up in the actual finished piece. (laughs) It it, it narratively doesn't work. Some scenes are way too long, some scenes are way too short, nobody gets any exposition, and it keeps trying to make jokes, and the jokes aren't very funny. Let's start out then with my critique of The Suicide Squad. First things first, the jokes fucking land. They do. Liam, the jokes land. I'm not going to say all the jokes land. There were a couple where I rolled my eyes and went, yeah, that's a bit lowest common denominator. But I laughed out loud at this film way more than I thought I was going to. Particularly John Cena as the peacemaker. He's got this ridiculous, uh, it's referred to as a toilet bowl a couple of times. He's got this ridiculous silver helmet on. And his whole thing is that he'll get peace at any cost. No matter how many men, women, and children he has to murder, he will get peace. Damn it. <laughs> and then he's played with that, that constant thing of the fact that his concept is so ridiculous. He gets a lot of the best gags and a lot of the best sight gags as well. That's something else this film is actually really good at and where it's got the humor right. The sight gags are actually funny, which helps mahoosively when it comes to actually having an enjoyable experience with this film. Secondly, 
the pacing and the exposition of this film works. Unlike Suicide Squad, where the pacing was all over the place, to the point where you think it was literally done randomly. They literally just spliced some film together and just went, you know what, that's good enough, send it out. This one actually moves at the right pace. You actually do get proper bits of exposition and they're given time to sit and fester and let the audience think about them. But it doesn't sit so long before it gets to a really good action set piece. And the action set pieces in this are really creative and clever and often very funny as well. It ties that in with the humor. I'll tell you what this film has done. It's looked at the boys. And that wasn't a bad thing to look at. No. Because the boys has got this whole fucked up superhero thing down pat. The Suicide Squad is very, very reminiscent of it. And it's something that I didn't think was derivative. I actually appreciated it. I think it was right to start aping that sort of thing because another program has got it better. And therefore, it's, it's a good point of reference. And that's one of the things that helps this film work. Third thing, characterization. You remember I reviewed uh, Birds of Prey? Yeah, I think you had um, quite an uh, enormous amount of disdain for that one. I had a huge number of issues with Birds of Prey. Yeah, I didn't think it worked at all. And the chief facet of it that didn't work for me was the characterization of Harley Quinn. Because Harley Quinn is supposed to be dangerous. And in Birds of Prey, she was this um, sad sack, uh, messed up party girl. Isn't she just like a massive dickhead? Yeah, she was, she, she was, um, I know there's a flippancy to the character and there's a, a funny element to that. But I thought the characterization of her was actually really quite lame and weak. And I thought it was a waste of Margot Robbie because Margot Robbie has actually got the character down pat. She really, really does. It's a great casting choice. She obviously loves the character. She's obviously the right person to play it. In this film, Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, actually gets the characterization she deserves. Yes, she's flippant. Yes, she's got funny lines. She's also massively dangerous, genuinely sadistic and twisted and impressive, which is just, I was almost clapping at the screen going, finally, finally, you've used Margot Robbie to her full effect. She's got the character down. In this film, that character is allowed to do what that character needs to do to push the film forward. Style is my fourth point. I think I'm up to four points at this point, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> Style. Again, Birds of Prey, it went with this really splashy aesthetic that ended up being messy and over-stylized and distracting rather than helping the film move forward. This is really, really slick. It's punchy. It's sight gags in terms of the way it uses cuts as jokes actually really, really work nicely. There's not too much splashy freeze frame stuff. It's an exercise in restraint when you compare it to the way Birds of Prey was put together. This is much snappier. This is much more stylish. This film's got a bit of verve and a bit of snap and a bit of zing to it. It doesn't want to sit too long. It wants to get you through the plot and go, hey, it's a bunch of supervillains going through an island taking over a dictator. Let's have some fun with that. And finally, Peter Capaldi as the thinker was a brilliant choice for the villain. The thinker, because Peter Capaldi essentially plays it, and here's the link you're going to love, like a Doctor Who villain. Oh, really? Now, everyone knows Peter Capaldi. I was as, hoping you were going to say Malcolm Tucker for a minute. There's, actually, <laughs> actually, there is a bit of Malcolm Tucker in you're there You're a as fucking well. omni-shambles. He's kind of pulling from his two best roles to put this character together, and that really works as well. Primarily, the thing that makes this better than the original Suicide Squad is that it's fucking coherent. But more than that, it is splashy, it is hyper-violent, I had a really great time with it, and it is funny. Not all the time, not everything lands, but a good 80% of the jokes worked way better than I thought they were going to. We heard a little bit of hype about this. When this came out, a lot of very, very serious film reviewers who really don't like the superhero stuff started coming forward and going, hey, actually, this ain't bad. So I had a little bit of a tingle of that when I went into it. But I thought, uh, you know, given how much has been fucked up previously, I'm sure it'll be a bit of a laugh. I'm sure it'll be a bit of a ride. I didn't expect to come out the other end of it going, that might actually be the best superhero film I've seen. It achieves every single goal it sets out to do. It's a hell of a lot of fun. It's got a really dark, twisted sense of humor that for the most part doesn't make you roll your eyes. It's a punchy Saturday night, have a laugh and watch some really, really spectacular. You know that thing we always bang on about with superhero films, that the set pieces, that whole um, building's falling over, all that kind of stuff. It ends up being boring. A lot of superhero films, the last half hour is bangy, crashy, smashy. You can't really tell what's going on. The camera's moving all over the place. This building falls over. A huge laser beam comes out of there and you go, this should be really exciting, but actually I'm just waiting for the film to end at this point. This film actually does the last half an hour 
where it is a big bangy, crashy action set piece where buildings fall over. And it's fun and invigorating and well shot and cleverly choreographed and exciting. And the film ends on a quite a poignant and still quite a funny note as well. It succeeds at absolutely everything it was trying That's to do. Right. Do you know what? I'm actually really happy to hear that because I know that I may have made myself sound like somebody who just has this all-encompassing blanket disdain for anything superhero related, but I do love, as I believe I've said before, I love The Dark Knight and I love Blade. And the thing, um, one of the many things that make those films great, one thing, one trait they share is um, because of, well, Wesley Snipes and several characters in Blade and principally because of Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, those films are not po-faced. So many of these fucking MCU films and even some DC films, they take themselves so seriously with this horrible Spielberg-esque swelling music telling you how to feel stuff. And it's, it's just like, ugh, embarrassing, cringe. Get mm-hmm. it away, get it away, get it away. The way that you're talking about this Suicide Squad sounds like it sort of has more, it's more of a bedfellow you know, stuff like The Dark Knight and Blade where you actually have levity among uh, the uber-violent set pieces. This is how it should be. You know how Birds of Prey tried to be punk? Yes. This film is actually This film is actually punk. Yeah. That's good. That's really good. Did I mention, by the way, I can't remember, did I mention that King Shark is voiced by Sylvester Stallone? You did, yeah. Well, I just want to say it again because uh, (laughs) King Shark might be my new favorite comic book character. A lot of the visual. He's unbelievably stupid. And so a lot of films will waste that writing and go, oh, let's keep making jokes about how thick he is. There are constant jokes about how thick King Shark is. And they're actually very, very funny. So basically, he's he's now my favorite super villain, I suppose. So you've got a super muscly humanoid shark going, yeah, 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 literally, literally, yeah. That's just worth the price of admission alone. (laughs) I I thought it was absolutely brilliant and very, very successful. And I very, very much want a sequel. Well done, James Gunn. He literally manages to fix all of the flaws of the first one, and then some. I'm glad to hear it, man. I genuinely am. Because I've, I've heard like a few people going, this new one's actually pretty good. Yeah. And my initial thing, I know it's I'm fairly biased, my initial thing was like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, fine. No, but, it's, mm. it's, it's a lot of fun. It's great in its own right. And it's standalone as well. You don't need to have any... Um, in fact, it's better, I think, for it to be standalone. I think it actually succeeds in that sense. It is of its own universe, although it's obviously part of the DC universe. And it's just a really, really fun, splashy ride. Go and check it out. Have a Saturday evening. You know, beers and a curry, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Wonderful. Okay, then. Well, let's finish off with some trivia. I I thought I'd do some trivia on June. Do you know what? I was hoping you were going to say that. (laughs) So you were just making me cream my pants. (laughs) Not literally, but... Not on that armchair. (laughs) (laughs) It's right. It's right. I won't dirty it all, lad. Let's start off with this one. An abandoned Dune film adaptation was supposed to be scored by Pink Floyd and star Salvador Dali. Yeah, Alejandro Jodorowsky's one. Yeah. Yeah. He said, uh, I wanted to do a movie that would give people who took LSD at that time the hallucinations you would get with that drug, but without hallucinating. (laughs) It sounds like he would have been well on his way, having approached Pink Floyd to do the soundtrack and surrealist painter Salvador Dali to portray Emperor Shaddam Carino IV. Also, it would have been a butt-numbing, I love this, 14 hours long. <laughs> have you ever seen... I've had trips that have lasted less time than that. Have you seen, have you seen the documentary, um, Khodorowsky's Dune? No, I haven't. It's really good, it's, you know, about it, because it's his... I mean, let's get out of the way, like, when you actually become privy to every, like what he was planning to do with Dune, that film would have been awful. <laughs> but the documentary about his quest to make it is excellent. Yeah. I'll, really I'll, worth it. I watch. will have to show that. Yeah. It has been recommended to yeah, me Yeah, definitely watch it. Yeah. I, I, I might watch it actually after watching this film. Just yeah. Just sort of put it in that order. Frank Herbert was inspired by the moving sands of Oregon. It all started with a scrapped magazine article. By the 1950s, coastal Oregon had gotten fed up with a serious ecological menace, sand dunes. As Herbert noted in a 1957 letter, sand dunes pushed by steady winds build up in waves analogous to ocean waves, except that they may move 20 feet a year instead of 20 feet a second. These waves can be every bit as devastating as a tidal wave in property damage, and they've even caused deaths. They drown out forests, kill game cover, destroy lakes, and fill harbors. The U.S. Department of Agriculture had begun experimenting with beach grasses near the seaside city of Florence, Oregon. 
A certain species with unusually long roots was liberally planted in an attempt to stop the sands from excessively shifting. Fascinated, Herbert flew in and started gathering notes for a piece entitled They Stopped the Moving Sands. But his agent refused to send it to publishers unless it was rewritten, which Herbert never did. Still, Herbert remained intrigued and, after boning up on deserts and religious figures, outlined the story that eventually became Dune. Do you know what? I, I love that novel and I am not familiar with that story. Yeah. yeah I thought it was quite interesting as that's well. That's really like fucking cool. Real life yeah. corollary. Yeah. That's another difficult one. Corol- <laughs> corolla <laughs> All the low planes on one of Saturn's moons are named after planets in the Dune canon. Saturn's largest moon, a body named Titan, contains some shady-looking terrain called Planitia, or the Low Plains, that are all named after Dune planets. The first one discovered is now known as Chusuk Plantia, in honor of the fictitious and musically-oriented planet Chusuk. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong for Dune fans. Chusuk, Chusuk. Um, just is- However you read it, I suppose. Uh, what's the spelling again? C H U S U K. Yeah, it's like Chusuk. Chusuk. Yeah, Chusuk. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a bit more lyricism in your. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I, I would. I read that word. Yeah, I would. I would think like you know Chusuk. <laughs> I would only think Chusuk if it had two S's in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, you like, know, like you know, Cossack. You know yeah. what I'm going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Once again, Cinematalist debates <laughs> pronunciation live. <laughs> it's almost like we should have meetings beforehand or something. And my last fact here. George Lucas's Star Wars once bore a much closer resemblance to Dune. Early drafts of the original Star Wars involved conflicts between Dune-like feudal houses, and, although these were omitted, characters in Lucas's breakout movie do mention spice mines, and the movie takes place on the desert planet of Tatooine. Coincidence? Herbert didn't think so. Good. He, he soon joked of banding together with several other ripped-off sci-fi authors to form a We're Too Big to Sue George Lucas Society. Well, it's true. Darth, Darth Vader, um, uh, Baron Harkonnen, uh, you know, Han Solo, you could say that he's, you know, he's an analogue to maybe Duncan Idaho. Fucking Luke Skywalker is Paul Atreides. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, well, I mean, Star Wars ripped off everything, didn't it? it? Yeah. He was doing fucking, you know, Kira Solo. Yeah, but you know, and I'm, I swear and... I'm not making this up. Like, people, I've actually come across, I hate, I hate this. You know, I actually, it boils my blood, but I've come across a few internet comments, people replying to like trailers, videos for like Dune trailers and saying like, What's this fucking film like trying to be like a new Star Wars or something? I think you little disrespectful piece of shit. <laughs> Do you not know what this is based on? <laughs> nerd rage. <laughs> it's normally my job to do nerd rage. It's just like, <laughs> fuck you. Actually, you know what? I've got one little quick fact here I just like to throw in. Uh, June was also influenced by psychedelic mushrooms. I'd imagine it would be. Yeah. <laughs> in Herbert's Dune universe, the single most valuable commodity is by far an edible substance called melange. Also known as spice, this highly addictive material is found only on the desert plains of Arrakis, where much of the action unfolds. Among its many properties are increased longevity and, in some cases, the ability to see the future itself. Yep. Sound trippy? There's a reason. While conversing with fungi expert Paul Stamets, Herbert revealed that the world of Dune was influenced by the life cycle of mushrooms with his imagination being helped along by a more magic variety. Yeah, I, you know, I cannot sound surprised. I mean, it was the 60s after all. But <laughs> Everyone was doing it's it. It's just nice for the, like, the village, you know, like in the fucking, the Lynch one, you know, they got heart plugs. That wasn't in the book. At one point, like, there's a mentat who, like, he has his heart attached to this cat. Like a cat. Yeah, I remember that. Bit. I remember I mean, laughing. He's actually talking about it with a mutual <laughs> friend. Go like, what the, what, what the fuck is this? Why are they doing this? Thankfully, the Villeneuve dude is bereft of all that shit. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely cannot wait to see it, man. Oh, it's all, I thought it was awesome. Okie dokie then. Well, that's the end of our free podcast this week. Uh, we're going to go and record the premium episode. I believe you've got some extra takes to start off I with. I do have a few extra takes for everyone, yes. And then we're going to go into... Oh, I had a witty name for this earlier and I've forgotten it. Oh, yes. Well, I'm calling it... Da, 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 the Crime Decline. The Crime Decline. Uh, we're going to have a chat about, we've referenced it before, but we're actually going to go in depth this time about how crime movies, these crime genres, seems to have gone a bit downhill of late. Yes, and do you know what? I, and I was I've given this a lot of thought. The reason I wanted to do it is because I do think that there is a demonstrable trend that can be delineated and pointed at. Not exclusively. It's not like a linear thing where, you know, none of the good ones exist anymore. 
but they, they're they more like outliers. And I just thought it'd be interesting for us to have a chat about that, see where we agree, see where we might diverge. Yeah, and, and some of the crime tropes that used to be great in like 70s cinema, that kind of thing. And they would still work for modern audiences as well. And a lot of the modern crime stuff is missing that kind of, that snappy thing that a lot yeah, of Yeah, they don't give their audiences have. a chance to, uh, you know, have their expectations subverted in a way that used to be quite commonplace. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be our topic for this week after Liam's extra reviews. If you'd like to listen to any of that, please do check out cinementalist.com for a link to our Patreon page. We release four premium podcasts a month and they are very good indeed, if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, if not, we'll be back for another free episode next week. Oh, of course, you can follow us at Cinementalcast on Twitter and you can follow Liam at... Liam at the movies at Wacko Jacko's Flicks. Lovely. Anything to end with, mate? Uh, just, as always, guys, thank you so much for listening. Hope you enjoy the content. Uh, yeah, check out those. If you haven't seen, even if you're not, again, I just want to reiterate, even if you're not a sci-fi or fantasy fan, please, please watch The Newest Dune because if you're just a movie fan, it looks fucking amazing. It sounds amazing. It's just really good. No, I'll plug it again, but I'm a massive, massive, massive fan of the thing. So I just have a massive erection that it's been done right. Well, there you go. Sorry, I just, yeah, I just had to say that. Unlike the rest of you at home, I'm stuck in the same room as him. <laughs> so there you go. All right, guys, thank you very much. We will see you either on the premium or next week. Take it easy. <laughs> <laughs>